Gather around, gather around, children, because it is time for some good old-fashioned quality wrestling education. Now, in case you've forgotten, ladies and gentlemen, I am the one and only DJ Storms, and I would like to welcome all of you back here to the channel right here on YouTube.com, as of course, you already know who I am, Mr. Controversy, and the operator of the best damn Twitter handle known to mankind. This is the official Lightning Flash update for September 21st, 2018. Now, first things first, I do want to make um, some announcements. Number one, um, I apologize that there was no rewind for WWE Hell in a Cell. College has me tied up. Um, this is probably some of the busiest classes that I've had in my entire school career. Um, just some brief thoughts on it. I thought it was a very good show, very well produced, outside of the last two matches that took place on the show. Um, the Raw Women's Championship match was a disaster, and Hell in a Cell match was one of the worst Hell in a Cell matches I've seen between Braun Strowman and Roman Reigns. Secondly, Rescue Mania 2, hosted by former... WWE and WCW superstar Crowbar will take place this Sunday at Felician University in Rutherford, New Jersey. We have the meet and greets starting at 12.30 and the actual show starting at 2.30. A lot of big independent stars are going to be there. We got Crowbar himself, Adam Payne, Bright Lights, Jared Foster, Gunner Trash, whom I've interviewed. I've also interviewed Crowbar if you want to go check that out on the channel, The Eye of the Storm with Christopher Ford and The Eye of the Storm with Gunner Trash. We also we also have Bull James, formerly known as Bull Debsey, appearing. Formerly, formerly known as Bull Debsey from NXT. And thirdly, um, I'm going to just clear the air before things start up of why I'm not covering the Mae Young Classic, mainly because it would be overkill. I talk about wrestling for... 30 to 40 minutes, um, this may go over 40 minutes because I'm making these announcements, but I usually try and keep it between that range, mainly because of the fact that um, I'm a very busy SOB outside of YouTube. Obviously, I've told you about my college classes. This is probably one of the busiest class, busy semesters that I've had, some of the busiest classes that I've had. I work on the weekends now, so that's going to take up a lot. Uh, you know, i got to pay for my car somehow. And thirdly, I can't do shows and like show reviews directly after the show, mainly because it would take away from either my study time or it would take away from the time that I have to watch the shows when they actually air. Because I don't really like going back and watching things that I've missed live. I've usually just um, I usually just catch the highlights. But all in all, that's why I'm not covering the Mae Young Classic, because it would be overkill on my show, and I'd have to split the Lightning Flash update in two, and I don't really want to record two videos every single week. Plus, a third or a fourth one if there's an NXT TakeOver or a main roster pay-per-view coming up. But regardless of that, we're going to get straight into the weekly show reviews. Um, Raw. That's, I, I have no words. Trash as always. And, and you know something? Some people were actually claiming that this, this was one of the best Raws of 2018. Are you mentally retarded? Best Raws of 2018? There was two good highlights on this show. Two good highlights on this show. And I'm going to point them out. Roman kicked off the show basically... You know, standing out, he went to hell and back with Strowman, yada, yada, yada. Strowman comes out. Strowman says he would go after Lesnar. And then Roman, Constable Corbin, comes out and he announced Crown Jewel, which will take place from Saudi Arabia on November 2nd, I believe they announced it, 2018. And the main event's going to be Braun Strowman versus Roman versus Lesnar in a triple threat match for the Universal championship. And then Braun Strowman just started saying that everything sucked. And notice how the biggest pop was when he said Roman sucked. But Roman is over. But Roman is over, they say. And then Corbin, well actually before Corbin made himself versus Roman Reigns, 
Paul Heyman came out and cut a promo, and Paul Heyman is still great at what he does. He's still great at cutting promos. I don't care. Whatever storyline he's in, he always makes it feel important with those promos. And then Corbin made himself versus Roman for the Universal Championship. And some people actually thought this was a good match. Some people actually thought this was a good match. It probably had maybe two or three high spots, but we're going to talk about that when we get later on in the show. This was one of the good parts of the show. This was one of the two good parts of the show. Drew McIntyre versus Dean Ambrose. This was a fairly short match, but for the time that they were given, these two put on a decent match. These two put on a decent fight. And Drew McIntyre ended up defeating Dean Ambrose with the Claymore kick. Dean Ambrose was actually planning on jumping to the outside. Drew McIntyre stepped out of the way, sent Ambrose into the barricade. He hit hard. And then when Ambrose got back into the ring, he met a Claymore right to the face. Chad Gable defeated Victor. This is the third week in a row you're going to have Bobby Roode and Chad Gable face the Ascension. Why not get Titus Worldwide versus Roode and Gable? You give those teams time. You give those teams time. They could put on a damn good match. Same thing with Heath Slater and Rhino versus Chad Gable and Bobby Roode. Why not? Why not Chad Gable and Bobby Roode versus the Altars of Pain? Why do the Altars of Pain have to continue squashing jobbers? So next week we're probably going to get Bobby Roode versus Connor. Same old recycled bullshit there. And then we had an Undertaker promo. And he said that Kane is going to be in his corner for the match at Super Showdown between himself and Triple H. So they're creating a nice dynamic there between himself, Kane, and then we got Shawn Michaels and Triple H on the other side. So it, it, it could very well be, be the main event of Super Showdown. I'm not going to lie. I mean, like, you could very well put that match on in the main event of Super Showdown, which I really wouldn't mind. I really wouldn't mind, but I think the WWE Championship should main event, considering that that title is the most prestigious title in the entire WWE. Bailey defeated Dana Brooke, who cares? Authors of Pain defeated Jobbers, who cares? This was the second good part of the show. And it was for the IC title. This was Rollins' second title defense of his second reign versus Dolph Ziggler. It was, it was a good match for what they put on. But I don't know. This was probably one of their worst encounters because it just fell flat. It really just fell flat. I don't know if it's because we've seen it so many times or it's because they were holding back. I don't know. Something about this match felt off. Something about the match felt off. It was still a good match, but by the end of it, by the end of it, it was just, it was just a shrug of the shoulders type of match. Like, yeah, it was good, but really, what's so special? Ronda Rousey was actually going to do a Raw Women's Championship open challenge, and it never happened. Natalia was originally set to do it, but the Riot Squad came out and attacked Natalia. They attacked Natalia in the back, dragged her out to the stage, and Riot... Ruby Riot specifically was going to take the open challenge. And then the Bellas made an assist. This is building towards Ronda Rousey and the Bellas versus the Riot Squad. And and possibly Nikki Bella versus Ronda Rousey at Evolution. When is Ronda Rousey going to get some legitimate competition? When? Ronda Rousey's best best match so far was that tag team match at WrestleMania. Her best singles match so far was with Nia Jax at WWE Money in the Bank. Nia Jax, she really isn't all that impressive, but she did a great job at making Ronda Rousey look like a legitimate competitor, singles-wise. What are we going to get Ronda Rousey? Why, why aren't we getting Ronda Rousey versus Natalya at Evolution? Why not Ronda Rousey versus Ember Moon? Why not put Ember Moon in that position and actually solidify Ember Moon as a top player? Ember Moon hasn't been established. She was used in a tag team match with the returning Nia Jax, speak, speak of the devil, the returning Nia Jax and Ember Moon defeating Alicia Fox and Mickie James just before the Universal Championship match. Like I said last week, the Bellas of the are the most overhyped and overrated women's wrestlers in WWE history. Nikki's way too stiff. Brie is way too sloppy. And they are, they, they are perhaps the most worthless women 
right behind Tamina and and Dana Brooke in the women's division. Those two and maybe you can even argue Alicia Fox and Carmella. Those those that group of women is without a doubt the most worthless group of women in the women's division right now. Bellows are nothing more than reality television stars. Leo Rush and Leo Rush and Bobby Lashley have been confirmed to be a manager manager competitor stable. So they are now a duo on Monday Night Raw, and Leo Rush is the official manager for Bobby Lashley. I'm going to give this a chance and let it play out, like I said, like I gave a chance with Rude and Gable. They're not really doing too good with Rude and Gable, but with someone like Leo Rush, I think it could work out. It could be almost like the new Enzo and Cass, but a little less annoying and much more entertaining. Lashley versus Elias ended in DQ. Owens came out. He tried to attack Leo Rush. Leo Rush is, without a doubt, probably... Probably a world champion if they booked him right. You could you could give this guy the world championship and he would make it look legit. Leo Rush is probably the slickest, smoothest cruiserweight they got right next to Mustafa Ali. He leapfrogged Bobby Lashley. The guy leapfrogged over... No, no, not Bobby Lashley. The guy leapfrogged over Elias and then did a moonsault off the apron. Elias caught him. He caused the DQ, but by the end of it, Rush and Elias double teamed. Both Elias and, or excuse me, Rush and Lashley double teamed both Elias and Kevin Owens. And then they stood tall. The main event, Roman versus Corbin for the Universal Championship. This was a chaotic mess. It was a chaotic mess. Like... The first, the first time around, it ended in disqualification, and then Corbin made it no DQ, and then Ziggler came out, McIntyre came out, The Shield came out, Braun Strowman came out, and everyone was flying all over the place, everyone was taken out, everyone, and then Roman just went to the ring and speared Corbin. The only reason why the crowd even reacted to this match is because they wanted to see Roman lose the title. And so did I. I would much rather take Baron Corbin, even though this constable gimmick is atrocious, I would rather take Baron Corbin than Roman Reigns as the Universal Champion. But this was a chaotic mess. It was stupid. It was pathetic. It was everything in between. I'm, I'm getting dehydrated just talking about Monday Night Raw. Matter of fact... I said I was going to continue this, tre this uh, trend. Let's do the second week in a row. We are going to have the lightning flash word of the week. Last week's lightning flash word of the week was poison used to describe Monday Night Raw. Today's lightning flash word of the week is stupid. It is an adjective. It means lacking in intelligence or smarts. I will use it in a sentence. Jeremy's comments about wrestling were absurd. One might even say he was stupid. Moving on to the next show. I think I've ranted and raved. I think I've ranted and raved about Raw for for enough. It's probably gonna take up like a fourth of my of my lightning flash update. But regardless, we're moving on. SmackDown Live, on the other hand. You know, I've said it before, I'll say it again. Raw makes SmackDown Live look like WrestleMania every week. The show was mainly built around two matches. There was some good stuff in between. Um, the beginning segment kind of fell flat. The ending segment was... Eh. I mean, it wasn't bad. Charlotte, Charlotte and Becky, feud is starting to heat up. Now we got the rematch at Super Showdown. I'll talk about that in a minute. Miz kicked off the show. He announced that it will be him versus Brian at Super Showdown for an opportunity at the WWE title. Maurice turned out to be his special guest. Maurice said that this would be your last time on SmackDown Live. Miz called out Daniel Bryan. Bryan drop kicked the Miz into Maurice, and Maurice, she faked the whole entire thing trying to pull on Daniel Bryan's heartstrings. And Maurice nearly, nearly, nearly fooled Daniel Bryan, but Daniel Bryan 
um, was almost caught with a skull-crushing finale by The Miz, as then Daniel Bryan pushed The Miz into Maurice. Maurice gets knocked off the apron, and Bryan takes out The Miz. This is all building towards the match at WWE Super Showdown. Cesaro versus Kofi Kingston. This was a decent match for what it was. There was a point in this match before Kofi Kingston mounted a comeback in which Cesaro delivered a huge uppercut, and I thought Kofi was legitimately knocked out. If you want to go back and watch the match, he just, boom, leveled him with an uppercut. And Kofi, I think he was almost turned inside out. It was, it was near the far corner. Kofi bounced up and down and did a tope con hero over the top. By the end of it, Cesaro... He deadlifts Kofi in the neutralizer position. He deadlifts Kofi from the floor into the neutralizer. Kofi looked like he landed right on his nose. He looked like he could have shattered his nose. And Cesaro gets the win. A brutal-looking neutralizer. If you want to go back and watch that, it, it was, it was nasty-looking. And then we had Aiden English and Rusev in the back. Rusev said that maybe Aiden English's best wasn't enough at WWE Hell in a Cell. And English started ranting and raving toward a backstage crew member. English was like, you know, I made Rusev day. This is all Lana's fault. He let his anger get the best of him. And Lana was right there behind him. She said she was going to tell Rusev before the match, but she didn't. In the back, we had Randy Orton. Randy Orton with, a, with, um, with, with his hand on the shoulder of a production truck member. And the production crook, uh, crook. The production truck member said, you're hurting me, sir. Randy Orton grabbed his face. He's like, is that better? And he goes, yes. <laughs> yes, sir. And Orton goes, wait, wait, wait. Stop the video right there. And he's watching... As he twists the screwdriver through Jeff Hardy's earlobe. And Randy Orton's looking at this guy. He's like, does that make you sick? Is that disturbing to you? And the guy's like, oh, yes, sir. <laughs> Randy Orton is keeping a straight face this entire time. And we're wondering who Randy Orton's next victim is. I don't think it's going to be anyone just yet. I think Hardy's going to return. He's going to get his rematch at Super Showdown. He's going to win. And then we're going to get the blow-off match at... SmackDown 1000, because like I said before, of the report that came out that Hardy and Orton is going to take place at SmackDown 1000. Styles was interviewed in the back, and he said that he needs to focus on Almas, or else his emotions will get the best of him, and his focus on Joe will cost him his match against Almas. His match against Almas was phenomenal, and I'm going to talk about that later. Shinsuke Nakamura versus Rusev for the United States Championship. This was Nakamura's third televised title defense. And this was a good match for what it was. It was a fairly short match, but for the time they were given, they put on a good match. There was a point in this match where Rusev went for the Machka kick, Nakamura moved out of the way, he went for the right mist, went for the left mist, and then got caught with a huge roundhouse kick right to the side of the face for a close, close, close two count. I really like that, uh, I really like that sequence. And if you pay attention, Nakamura and Rusev, they do have some chemistry together. Their matches together, specifically the one at Fastlane and this match, are very underrated. Their matches together are underrated. We were out on the apron. Rusev was dazed on the apron. Nakamura delivers a huge jumping knee to the chest. Gets Rusev back into the ring. And he ran right into a Machka kick. And Nakamura sells the Machka kick beautifully. Then, Nakamura was down and out. Rusev was going for the accolade. Aiden English takes the microphone, jumps up on the apron, yells out, Rusev, crush. Rusev gets distracted. Nakamura rolls him up for the win. So Nakamura, right man one. Nakamura retains the United States Championship. Where does Nakamura go from here? I would have him face R-Truth at Super Showdown to get a fourth successful title defense in there. And then he could possibly move on to Almas, either at SmackDown 1000 or at Crown Jewel. I would do it at Crown Jewel give almost a little more momentum behind him. What happened next was actually pretty shocking. 
Rusev was just recovering. Aiden English just blasts him in the back of the neck with a microphone. And when he was nailing Rusev with a microphone, you could really see that he was legitimately hitting Rusev in the face. Rusev did not get his arms up to block it. He was legitimately hitting Rusev in the face with the microphone. It did not look pretty. But I loved what Aiden English did after this. He just, he just somberly singed into the microphone in a very dark tone. Happy Rusev Day. If they want to, they could make Aiden English a main roster dialed down version of Tommaso Ciampa if they wanted to. He's got that look. He's got that feel to him. Because Rusev is such a lovable babyface. And we've grown to love Rusev. This was a very good unpredictable because I thought that Rusev was going to be the one to turn heel, but they went ahead with English. A very good, unpredictable move. I, I think that we might see this at Super Showdown. AJ Styles versus Andrade Cien Amos. My God, what a great match this was. This was a great television match. This match and Shinsuke versus Rusev really made the show. AJ and Amos went back and forth. AJ countered the double knees. Um, later on in the match, we had Amos hitting the springboard drop kick. And then, AJ had a jackknife cover, a float over bridge. He reversed it into the Styles Clash so smoothly, and he beat Amos. I don't know why Amos is losing so much. I think that they might be grooming him for a big spot by having him face these top-tier superstars. Samoa Joe then attacks, but Styles was able to fend him off. Styles was ready for Joe this time. That's all building towards the no-disqualification match at... Super Showdown. Asuka then defeated Billy Kay. This was a nothing match. You could have basically skipped it. Becky Lynch Championship Coronation. Charlotte was asked to come out by Becky. The rematch was set for Super Showdown, and Becky was just rubbing it in. Rubbing it in that she's the better woman. By the end, there was a brawl, and Becky stood tall. Not a bad episode of SmackDown Live. Two matches really made the show. Moving on to 205 Live. 205 Live was a very good show, mainly because of one match. This was a one-match show, and it was because of the main event. And they did what I've been saying they should do. They moved 205 Live before SmackDown Live. So, I think that if they continue to do this, 205 Live will prosper much more. I mean, look at what happened, look what happened in the main event. The crowd were alive for it. The crowd were much more alive for the main event than they usually are for a 205 Live main event. TJP versus Lince Dorado. This was a decent match for what it was. Crowd was into Lince Dorado. Um, there was some back and forth action here. Lince Dorado hit a huge moonsault. Uh, he was on a roll. I think he hit a spin kick at some point in the match. This match ended when TJP legitimately ripped the mask off of Lince Dorado. Lince was trying to hide his face. And TJP rolled up Lince Dorado for the win. So I'm assuming that this is not going to be the end. And they are going to have a feud. Or TJP is going to have a feud specifically with the Lucha House Party. Leo Rush was talking to Drake Maverick saying how he needs to fulfill his obligations with Bobby Lashley. But Maverick said... You're going to compete on 205 Live. You're going to fulfill your obligations as a member of the 205 Live roster. You're going to face Noam Dar next week. So we got Leo Rush versus Noam Dar next week. Next week, also, the rematch between Hideo Itami and Mustafa Ali was made. So you can imagine at how good that match is going to be. The main event. You know, if you really wanted something to really be proud of when it comes to professional wrestling, especially with a promotion like 205 Live, which really hasn't been taken all that seriously, this was the match to do it. This match was better than all of Monday Night Raw and possibly all of SmackDown Live outside of that heel turn by Aiden English and that match between Styles and Almas. Cedric Alexander versus Drew Gulak for the Cruiserweight Championship. This was a great back and forth match. It started off a little slow. Kendrick and Gallagher got ejected from ringside. It picked up when Cedric, he had Gulak in a suplex position. 
He suplexed Gulak over the top rope. Gulak landed on his feet while Cedric was holding on. Cedric came with him, still in the suplex hold, and he suplexed him on the outside. And a splat was heard right throughout the arena. That suplex looked brutal. And it was in one fluid motion from the ring, backwards, over the top, still hooked, suplex to Gulak. Back in the ring, we had that springboard clothesline by Cedric, in which I am such a fan of. Drew Gulak had the Gulak locked in a couple times in this match, but Cedric was able to get out of it. We had Drew Gulak actually leaving his feet, and they the commentators played it up as Drew Gulak is breaking his own laws, but Drew Gulak was willing to go through hell and high water to get the Cruiserweight Championship. Diving clothesline looked beautiful, and Cedric sold it like a beast. He turned inside out, turned upside down, inside out, for a close two count. The crowd was into it. The crowd was much more alive. Cedric Alexander... In the end of this thing, hit a huge back elbow and muscled Gulak up for the lumbar check to secure his fifth successful title defense as Cruiserweight Champion. Now he moves on to Super Showdown to face Buddy Murphy, and I think that this is Murphy's time. I think Buddy Murphy is going to take this. Cedric has had a great run. Cedric has had a phenomenal run. Five successful title defenses going into his sixth. I think it's Buddy Murphy's time, and then they're going to build towards Buddy Murphy versus Mustafa Ali, possibly at the Royal Rumble. Great match between Cedric Alexander and Drew Gulak. Definitely worth going back and watching. WWE NXT was also sort of a one-match show. It wasn't really all that eventful. Aaliyah and Lacey Evans defeated Dakota Kai and Deanna Perrazzo. It was a eh, kind of a lackluster match. It was a little sloppy. This match was sloppy here and there. But by the end of it, they're continuing to build off the rivalry between Lacey Evans and Dakota Kai. I'm assuming we're supposed to get a singles match at some point between Lacey Evans and Dakota Kai. Jackson Riker of the Forgotten Sons. If you do not know who Jackson Riker is, he is former TNA superstar Gunner. So... WWE just continuing to pile in and pile in the former TNA guys. He defeated Humberto Carrillo with a huge slingshot powerbomb, just manhandling this guy. Jackson Riker wins. Candice LeRae is being talked to by William Regal, and she said that Gargano would not attack Aleister Black. However, he did say to wait in the locker room until he took care of some business, and then they would have gone home. So, William Regal, trying to figure out who attacked Aleister Black. I don't know who it, who it might be, but assuming that it has some connection to John and Gargano and Candice LeRae, it should be good. Gargano was not on this edition of NXT, by the way. Lars Sullivan will be in action next week, as well as Otis Dojovic. Otis Dojovic is going into singles competition against the NXT champion, Tommaso Ciampa. This should be an interesting match. Speaking of matches, this match was more than just interesting. Wow. Pete Dunne versus Ricochet. Champion versus champion for the UK and the North American Championship. Wow. You know, I don't care if this sounds kind of like a stretch, but this was probably the best NXT television match all year. And, and on top of that, this was probably Pete Dunne's best match since Tyler Bate at NXT TakeOver Chicago. Pete Dunne's had some good matches here and there with Adam Cole, Johnny Gargano, Zach Gibson, but none on the level of Tyler Bate and Pete Dunne at TakeOver Chicago won. This was on that level, and that just shows you how good Ricochet really is. What, what wrestling... What 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 a match this was. The wrestling that was in this match, the spots that were in this match, huge hurricane ranas from the top rope, handspring moonsault into a tornado DDT, Pete Dunne with an X-Plex into the armbar. Wow. 
By the end of this, the Undisputed Era causes a DQ. The War Raiders chase them away. Ricochet and Pete Dunne hold their respective titles, looking at each other as NXT goes off the air with the crowd chanting NXT. This match, Pete Dunne versus Ricochet, Gulak versus Cedric, and AJ versus Almas are three matches worth going back and watching this week. Pete Dunne versus Ricochet was the best. Moving on to the news, rumors, and reports. Number one, in case you didn't see it earlier this week, according to PW Insider, Rey Mysterio has signed a two-year deal with the WWE. So you can expect to see Rey Mysterio at the Super Showdown. I would love to see where Rey Mysterio goes, whether he's on Raw SmackDown or 205 Live. I think he's going to flourish because he's Rey Mysterio. The Wrestling Observer Newsletter reported that there are certain talks about Matt Riddle versus Cassius Ono. Cassius Ono called out Matt Riddle on NXT a couple of weeks ago in his little sit-down with William Regal and the detective. Matt Riddle versus Cassius Ono is being discussed for NXT TakeOver War Games 2. I really don't mind it because it's going to be a great match, but ultimately, you're trying to build up Cassius Sono as a new man. But where is this going to go? Where is this really going to go? Are you going to have Matt Riddle lose in his first major feud for NXT? You're really going to have Cassius Ono just lose after he's been built up to almost be like an unstoppable monster heel, so to speak? He's not fully at that heel stage yet, but ultimately... Cassius Ono is a new man. If you're going to put Cassius Ono in a match with Matt Riddle, it's almost, um, it was, it's almost, it's almost fait accompli. You have to have Matt Riddle win. I mean, if you're going to have Cassius Sono defeat Matt Riddle, make things a little interesting, I wouldn't mind that. Try to build up Matt Riddle as an underdog, but I don't see, um, WWE doing that, especially Triple H with Matt Riddle and the fact that they would willingly give him a chance. Excuse me. I had some bad seasonal allergies. What are you going to do? But moving on with the news, rumors, and reports. The SAP Center in San Jose, California, for those of you who do not know where that is or what, what it is hosting, it is the arena that's hosting TLC at the end of the year. I believe it's on December... 16th, if I'm not mistaken. I'll have to go and check that. I'm probably wrong. But supposedly it's on December 16th. And this is the arena hosting TLC. And it has been advertising The Shield versus Braun Strowman, Drew McIntyre, and Dolph Ziggler in a six-man tag. Aren't we getting this at Super Showdown? Aren't we getting this at Super Showdown? Why do we need to backtrack and... Put it on again. Are you going to have this match at Survivor Series as well? You have this match at Survivor Series, Super Showdown, and TLC? Are you going to drag this feud all the way through the year just so Braun Strowman could lose? Are you really going to put Roman Reigns in the main event against The Rock? Are you really going to have The Rock win the Royal Rumble and give everyone the middle finger again? Are you really going to go through with this? This Shield reunion has done nothing for Ambrose, Rollins, Roman, Ziggler, McIntyre, or Strowman. You could say it's done something for Ziggler and McIntyre because they're tag team champions, but ultimately, based on what's been going on, WWE looks like they're going to give the titles to Drew McIntyre and Dolph Ziggler. Why are they going to give the titles to Drew McIntyre and Dolph Ziggler and then put them on Ambrose and Rollins? You're going to put them on Ambrose and Rollins, what? A month, a month and a half after Ziggler and McIntyre have had a reign? You're going to treat Ziggler and McIntyre that poorly just for the Shield? You're going to treat Braun Strowman that poorly just for Roman? You're going to treat Drew McIntyre and Dolph Ziggler that poorly just for this whole storyline to get Roman over, to get the Shield over, and then drag Roman to the main event of WrestleMania 35? To face The Rock? 
How many main events at WrestleMania does Roman Reigns realistically need to have? The guy's done nothing to deserve it. The guy has proved nothing. The guy hasn't proved anything. I don't. I still don't even understand why they gave Roman Reigns the Universal Championship to begin with. The guy's done nothing but lose this entire year. The guy lost the Intercontinental title to The Miz, lost the Royal Rumble, lost at WrestleMania, lost at the Greatest Royal Rumble, and no, there was no controversy. If you look closely, Roman's right foot did not hit the ground. It was in the apron before Brock Lesnar rolled off the cage. Thirdly, he lost a Money in the Bank qualifying match, and then he lost to Bobby Lashley at Extreme Rules. Six huge career losses this year. Six. But yet, he gets a Universal Championship shot at SummerSlam in a six-minute finisher fest and wins. Why didn't you give the title to Rollins? Why didn't you just give the title to Strowman? Why did we have to go through that terrible ending and that terrible hell in a cell just so Rollins and Ziggler could fall off the cell and Braun Strowman could realistically get robbed by Roman, by, um, by, uh, Mick Foley. Mick Foley counted three. Braun Strowman should be the universal champion. And then Brock Lesnar kicked the door off and then caused a double, double draw or a, a no contest. Both men are down. That he causes a draw, a no contest in a hell in a cell match? A hell in a cell match. There are no rules. There are no disqualifications. There are no countouts. A Hell in a Cell match goes on until somebody wins. Why did we have to have Brock Lesnar all of a sudden cause a double DQ? Or a double a double double countout? Both men couldn't compete. Jeff Hardy! Look at how many spots Jeff Hardy had done to him in his Hell in a Cell match with Randy Orton. The guy suffered. The guy suffered being crunched in between a ladder. The guy suffered steel chair sh shot after steel chair shot. For Christ's sakes, Randy Orton put a screwdriver in his ear. He put a screwdriver through the guy's earlobe and twisted it. He swung back and forth like a monkey and fell face first through the table. And Randy Orton still covered him in one. Jeff Hardy took all of that and the ref didn't stop the match. What makes the F5 more brutal than both? Than, than like all those things I just named. What makes the F5 more brutal than being crunched in between a ladder, being hit with a steel chair, having a screwdriver in your earlobe, being twisted upside down and all around, going face first through a table from a 20 foot drop? What makes that less impactful and less painful than an F5? That was a terrible ending to that Hell in a Cell match. I hope we don't get the Shield versus Strowman, McIntyre, and Ziggler again. I hope not. What, are you going to have this for all the gold? You're going to have this for all the gold? And then you're going to have the Shield finally bury all three of them and give the biggest middle finger to the audience since Roman Reigns winning the Royal Rumble in 2015? Moving on before I have an aneurysm. Dave Meltzer from the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, speaking of this Hell in a Cell ending with Brock Lesnar, um, Dave Meltzer reported that this whole Brock Lesnar issue and Brock Lesnar's interference at Hell in a Cell, this was not a last minute decision. This was planned by WWE ahead of time to set up Crown Jewel's main event. There were, reports, there were reports about Brock Lesnar competing in Saudi Arabia. Now the reports have been confirmed. It's going to be Brock Lesnar, Roman, and Strowman at WWE Crown Jewel. So this was not a last-minute decision. WWE didn't just think of Crown Jewel automatically. WWE knew what they were doing. WWE definitely knew what they were doing. And my final report before we end the Lightning Flash update for this week, and I get ready for Rescue Mania 2. Cage Side Seats reported that WWE has been scouting the Mexican indie scene and they have been currently watching WWE, or excuse me, um, indie wrestling star Bandito. Bandito was in the main event of All In with Mysterio, Ray Phoenix, the Young Bucks, and Kota Ibushi. 
They have been scouting Mexican indie star Bandito, and they are very interested in signing him. So, you're going to sign Pentagon Jr., Ray Phoenix, and Bandito to form a new stable in the Mexican heritage area? I would love to see the Lucha Bros and Bandito face off against the Lucha House Party. That would be a good one. I wouldn't mind I wouldn't mind seeing that. I would love to see Pentagon Jr. and Ray Phoenix versus the Undisputed Era. But there's been reports going around that supposedly Lucha Underground has Pentagon Jr. and Ray Phoenix until 2020. So we're not going to be seeing them for a while. We're not going to be seeing them for a while. But based on NXT's tag team division, take a look at what they got already. You could get you could get the Lucha Bros versus the Street Profits, the War Raiders, Danny Burch and Oni Lorcan, uh, maybe the Forgotten Sons, the Mighty. So, the tag team division in NXT could take a step up when the Lucha Bros come around. And or if Bandito comes around. I don't know anything about Bandito, so I'm not sure if he has that Lucha Underground contract locked until 2019, but I will keep you guys posted should I hear any new reports or rumors. But ladies and gentlemen, that wraps up this edition of the Lightning Flash Update. I can't control my dog. What are you going to do? I would like to thank each and every single one of you who tuned into this video. Do not forget to like, comment, subscribe. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at the DJ Storms. Do not forget to check out the rundown. Actually, you already saw, every, everyone already saw the rundown for Hell in a Cell, so you don't, you don't really need to check that out. But I will be making a video of the live matches and my live reactions from Rescue Mania 2, so you guys can keep an eye out for that. I'm going to probably post that either on Monday or Tuesday, depending on how much college work I have. But ladies and gentlemen, I'm the one who don't, I'm the one and only G, uh, DJ Storms. I can't even speak today, and my dog is distracting me. This has been the Lightning Flash Update. I would like to wish each and every single one of you a great day, a great night, and you have a great weekend.